Welcome everyone. We are now live with the event, European State of Hate, Far-Right Extremism in Europe. Hi everyone, and uh, thank you for joining us today, one day ahead of the inaugural EU Anti-Racism Summit, um, for what we think is a deeply interconnected discussion on the state of the far right in Europe. Uh, my name is Alina Brickman. I am the Director of EU Affairs at B'nai B'rith International, a Jewish advocacy and service organization working globally to safeguard Jewish life, tackle anti-Semitism, and stand in solidarity with other communities towards what we think is the shared goal of bringing about societies free of hate. Um, we are glad to be co-hosting today's event um, with the whole Hope Not Hate Charitable Trust and the European Parliament Anti-Racism and Diversity Intergroup. Um, Hope Not Hate is really an outstanding organization focused on using research, education, and public engagement to uh, challenge mistrust and racism and to help build communities that are inclusive and resilient to hate. The organization monitors far-right extremism and produces analysis in the UK and Europe-wide, and they were the lead research organization putting together the landmark report we will be speaking about today, the European State of Hate 2021. And RD, the European Parliament Anti-Racism and Diversity Intergroup, is the cross-party group of MEPs of members of the European Parliament working to promote racial equality, to counter racism, and educate about non-discrimination in the European Parliament. RD is really at the heart of parliamentary parliamentary work um, for racial equality and equity and against discrimination. Um, we are really pleased to be joined today by uh, two co-presidents of RD, um, MEP uh, Pierrette Herzberger-Fofana and MEP Monica Silvana Gonzalez. Uh, MEP Herzberger-Fofana is a member of the Greens from Germany and MEP Gonzalez is a member of the Socialists and Democrats from Spain. Um, and they will lead us towards our panel discussion with introductory remarks. Um, and before passing the floor to MEP Herzberger Fofana, um, let me just take a moment to note the significance of today's discussion for, for B'nai B'rith International. Um, we've witnessed throughout the pandemic an incredible growth in conspiracy myths that um, are shaping Jews as culprits. We've witnessed uh, demonstrations ta taunting Nazi symbols and slogans. We've witnessed a wave of attacks and vandalism. And through what has been sometimes quite entangled narratives um, that have emerged from this, we've seen an increasingly more daring, more emboldened and more explicit emerging far right. And with, um, anti with the anti-Semitic terrorist attacks in Halle, in Poway, in Pittsburgh, not far back in the rear view mirror, along with those in Hanau and Christchurch and just too many others, including um, as appears so far, yesterday's violent um, attacks in Georgia. We've been reminded of the danger and the vulnerability in the face of what is not a series of lone wolf attacks, but really a global ideology prefaced on anti-Semitism and that has targeted all minority groups and all signs of diversity. That is why I'm especially pleased to be holding today's event in partnership with two groups that champion precisely that diversity. And on that note, uh, let me give the floor to MEP Herzberger Fofana. Um, Pierret, please, the floor is yours. Perhaps I can propose that we um, first go to MEP Gonzalez and then return to you and perhaps the, the sound is fixed by then. Okay, perfect. Uh, can you hear me well? Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I am beginning in English, but I try to do my best. Uh, thank you, Alina, for organizing this event together with the colleagues from the Hope uh, Not Hate organization. 
uh, I am a, a, a pro to co-host this discussion with my colleague Pierre Fofana, my fellow RD uh, intergroup co-chair. I am also very glad to exchange with uh, Mr. Tamas Kadar from Equinet. Uh, welcome, everybody. I hope uh, you all will follow the first EU summit uh, on anti racism happening tomorrow. The Commission, the Portuguese uh, Council Presidents, civil society, um, member states, uh, and representatives, and, and, and the Parliament will discuss uh, structural racism, the new EU anti racism action plan, and relevant legislation. Nevertheless, less, uh, it is important that the European Parliament has even more presence as the European institution, institution representative the diversity of uh, European citizens. My main messengers uh, for the summit is that this should be an opportunity to find consensus among institutions. We very uh, much need consensus uh, on how to continue because the anti-racism legislation has failed us. We still, we do not have the right laws and law and, and policies. So we need to, to work on developing the new legislation that must include all scope of, of action not only employment and service. As Directive 43 and, and 73 from the years uh, 2000, we must include concrete measures to fight racism in all of its form. We must also improve conditions from the implementation of the right tools. There is a lot of work ahead of us. For that to happen, we need more data uh, and more in deep analysis in a time of rising racism and xenophobia. It is a vital to build a good basis that can contribute to appalling EU values, in particular, the respect of human dignity. Right wing, extremist idea and group are posing a grave threat to democratic societies. It is time to recognize it as a involvement scourge that affect different community experiences racism. Uh, Julius, uh, Roman uh, people, African descendant people, uh, Muslim and indigenous people. More than ever, we must be a unit in fighting against far-right ideologies. The attacks in hell in Hanau, these were all far-right motivated. The white nationalism agenda of all the people involved is one that is connected to various forms of hatred. As a Spanish member, a European member, I am deeply under to know the neo-Nazi march are a continuing reality in my, uh, in my country today. Just in February, about 300 neo-Nazi marched through Madrid to pay contribute to Spanish collaborator on, of the Nazi in World War II. Participate made the Nazi salute and sang fascism song, declaring that they are fighting for Spain and for Europe. Yet there is nothing more anti-technical to the very foundation of post-war Europe than this. The European Union, as we know, it is today was built to ensure that Nazism and fascism, white nat nationalism and war rights populism may never again emergency. That is why I want to highlight the effort that we are making to finally pass the law 
an equal entertainment and no discrimination from the Spanish government. Also call it the Cerolo law in the, in the name of a great activities, activists for diversity, uh, his name uh, was Pedro Cerolo. This law will allow to combat and prevent discrimination and provide care for the victims. It will also allow for administrative sanction because discrimination won't come for free and it will, it is, will be punished. This is why it is very important to learn about the result of your research. Your research. Uh, Pierre Fofana reflects, uh, I will, on the resolution that we adopted in the parliament. We join our forces together in the Intergroup and we always strive to base our work on the needs of people. Now uh, it is the time that we listen and understand how to better follow up in the future. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you so much, uh, MEP Gonzalez. And I take note of some of the important points you mentioned. You spoke of legislation um, both on an EU level, but also the important of, importance of legislation on the national level. And thank you for reminding us all of the very, very recent history of the neo-Nazi march in Madrid. And I think the fact that such marches are happening on an annual basis in European capitals is really a, a reminder and should be an energizer for civil society um, to remain vigilant and engaged. Um, allow me to now pass the floor to, to MEP Fofana and see whether we have more luck on the technical side. Yeah, can, can you hear me now? Yes, yes, perfect. Okay, thank, thank you. you. I'm so sorry for what's happened. Yes. No Hello. Good afternoon, everybody. And thank you very much for joining us today to discuss this very important topic with my fellow MEP, Monica, and uh, with you. Far-right extremism is a reality, reality in my country, in Germany. In February last year, the mass shooting by a far-right terrorist in Hanau took the life of 10 people. It was the second deadly far-right terror attack in Germany in less than half a year. Following the attack against a synagogue and kebab shop in Halle in October 2019. Also in June 2020, Germany came face to face with the racism and far-right extremism within the ranks of its armed force. The defense ministry officially dismantled a company of the German army's special forces after several far-right incidents. The global anti-racism movement has highlighted the problems of racism and discrimination in Europe. However, I am pleased to learn that the commission has developed an action plan and is about to create the post of coordinator to combat racism in the European Union. After months of ad advocacy, our appeal has borne fruit and our proposal has been accepted, such as the anti-racism summit that is taking place tomorrow. What I personally experienced last year is proof that racism is a reality. In indeed, how to explain the behavior of the police towards me, if it's not that their prejudice has made them deaf and blind. Deaf because they could not imagine that I was a deputy and blind in spite of the four pieces of ID I had shown them. The driver had to confirm orally that I was a member of parliament for them to believe it. This was for me a traumatic and humiliating experience. We need to come together because we still have a lot of work to do to achieve a truly anti-racist European Union. As we tackle racism in, in its various forms, be it Islamophobia, anti-black, 
and racism, anti-Gypsies or anti-Semitism, it is important to remind ourselves that the hatred promoted by far-right extremists is one that looks beyond this distinction and presents a common threat. We see today, under the burden of many global challenges, and particularly the COVID-19 pandemic, the re-emergence and globalization of far-right extremism. We see this trend manifesting in the street, online, and as well in the political arena, with far-right parties gaining more and more supporters across Europe. The Black Lives Matter movement is a particularly strong catalyst for the extreme right. Our fight for a racial reckoning across our society, across the Atlantic, mobilized extremist groups on the right to be more vocal and shameless. These are, as you can see, unfortunately, too many reasons, personal and political, why I am very excited to hear about the results of your research and explore together how to put it in a good use. Thank you. Thank you so much, MEP Fofana. And just to say, I remember listening to your testimony in the European Parliament after the incidents you had with police, and it was a chilling testimony. And I think it's incredibly valuable. And I thank you for being so open and public about that experience. I think it helped educate a lot of people at the time. Thank you very much to both our host MEPs. And um, we would love for you to remain, if the time allows, throughout the discussion. And we look forward to any reflections you have. And especially, uh, we would love for you to offer concluding remarks, if your schedule will permit. And now, um, allow me to introduce you to our panel today. Uh, to present and reflect on the report produced by Hope Not Hate and partner organizations are Gemma Levine, um, who is deputy director at Hope Not Hate. Uh, Gemma leads education work and work with faith communities within the organization. Prior to joining Hope Not Hate, she worked for nonprofits in the UK and the United States. Uh, she holds an MA in social anthropology from the University of Edinburgh and is a graduate of the Susie Bradfield Education Leadership Program and the Senior Faith Leadership Program as well. Dr. Joe Malha, Senior Researcher at Hope Not Hate. Uh, Joe is a historian of post-war and contemporary fascism. Uh, he completed his PhD at Royal Holloway University of London. Um, he's part of the board uh, of the Holocaust Memorial Day Trust in the United Kingdom um, and has published extensively. Um, I invite you to look up his two books published just in 2020, British Fascism After the Holocaust, From the Birth of Denial to the Notting Hill Riots, and the International Alt-Right Fascism for the 21st Century, where he was a co-author. And last but certainly not least, we're really glad to be joined by Tamás Kadar, who is Deputy Director at Equinet, the European Network of Equality Bodies. Um, Equinet brings together public institutions fighting discrimination at the national level, and their work spans a multitude of topics from gender and gender identity to age, disability, race, ethnic origin, religion or belief, and more as well. As deputy director, Tamash is the head of the legal and policy work within Equinet. Um, and prior to this, uh, Tamash has worked with the Council of Europe and the OSCE, similarly on issues pertaining to discrimination. So thank you so much for, for joining us today, Tamash. This said, um, let me turn over to Joe first, as I think your base, best place to, first of all, introduce to us the report, broadly speaking and the rationale behind it, the scope, the approach, um, and from there to take us toward what were your key findings, the trends you were able to narrow down on, and as well, perhaps some of the takeaways of the public polling you've conducted. Yes, absolutely. Um, firstly, thanks uh, so much for having me. Uh, thanks so much for organizing this, and thank you, of course, the members of the European Parliament for joining us and giving up your time for this. It's, it's uh, 
it's really exciting that we can bring these this many people together to have this conversation. Um, yeah, I mean, I'll give a very brief overview of the report and our findings. And we've done some polling across Europe as well, which has got some interesting, but also troubling findings. I mean, broadly speaking, the report we're all talking about is, is called the European State of Hate 2021. And it was a collaborative effort between Hope Not Hate in the United Kingdom, the Expo Foundation in Sweden and Amadeo Antonio Foundation in Germany. But it also brought together about 34 leading experts, uh, academics, scholars, researchers, um, experts from all different fields from across the continent to contribute. So it brought together a huge number of people and groups to kind of tell the story of hatred and the politics of division in Europe at the moment. And I guess before I just get into what the report says, I'll just say briefly why we wanted to do it. Uh, and broadly speaking, we wanted to do a report on a Europe-wide basis because to understand the threat posed by the contemporary far right, especially in racism more broadly, we have to look beyond our own communities, uh, beyond our own countries even, we have to look across borders. And in some ways we actually have to even go beyond our continent and think globally. The threat posed by the politics of hatred and division is, is a genuinely international phenomenon now. And so the way we approach this report was through that lens of being very international. But also the way that the modern far right operates is not just within the confines of traditional far right organizations. So while this report does look at the role of the AFD in Germany, Front National in France, Vox in Spain, Sweden Democrats in Sweden, Orban in Hungary, Law and Justice in uh, Poland, uh, I mean, I could go on. While it does look at those traditional organizations, it also goes beyond that to look at individuals and movements which cross borders. Uh, these increasingly what we call post-organizational networks are increasingly important for understanding how the far right works. It's not just these traditional groups. Often it's lots and lots of individuals operating outside of the confines of traditional organizations online, on social media, and collaborating towards particular issues or events. I always remember uh, Marine Le Pen after the last presidential elections releasing a video where she said she wanted to thank the online militants from all over the world that had helped her campaign. So this report tries to look at the far right as it actually is. And so there is a series of essays looking at the effect of COVID-19 and how the far right has attempted to exploit that, looking at conspiracies. There's articles on Black Lives Matter and the fallout and the backlash against that. There's some specific articles on Poland and the Western Balkans. And then there is over 30 country reports that goes country by country, lining out the far right threat in those areas. Now, before I get on to the key findings, just to kind of ram home what I mean by this internationalization, this kind of global threat, I thought I'd just touch on, uh, we've talked about terrorism and this report does look at the threat posed by far right terrorism. But if we look at the Christchurch attack uh, from 2019, 15th of March, if we just unpack that very briefly, what that looked like in terms of an international far right threat. Obviously, as we know, a gunman burst into the Al Noor Mosque and then the Linwood Islamic Centre in Christchurch, killing 51 and injuring a further 49. And this happened in New Zealand, of course, Christchurch. But the killer himself was actually from Australia. And when you read his manifesto, he was inspired by the actions of the British terrorist Darren Osborne, the Swedish school murderer Anton Lundin, the US church murderer Dylan Roof, the Norwegian mass murderer Anders Breivik, inspired from attackers from all over the world. His manifesto referenced uh, Oswald Mosley, the fascist from the UK, but also the American white supremacist slogan, the 14 words. And he flagged reference points and historical narratives from the international anti-Muslim movement, the counter-jihad movement, and of course was in large part influenced by the European identitarian movement. Again, drawing their ideas from around the globe. Before his attack, he spent time in France, Croatia, Bulgaria, Hungary, Turkey, Bosnia, Herzegovina, all of which influenced his politics. And then if we, of course, remember his victims on that day, they were Muslims from New Zealand, but there was also migrants and refugees from Pakistan, India, Malaysia, Indonesia, Turkey, Somali, Afghanistan, and Bangladesh. The Christchurch terror attack was a truly international tragedy perpetrated, yes, by one terrorist, 
but it was motivated by a genuinely global movement. Uh, and this is how we have to understand the threat that's posed by the modern far right. Now, a, a few of the very key findings from this. One, of course, is this internationalization. We talk at length about how the far right needs to be understood internationally. Another one is, has already been mentioned, this rise and explosion of conspiracy theories and QAnon more broadly. Um, in, in 2020, we saw unprecedented numbers of people engaging with conspiracy theory content online during the pandemic. Some of this was purely just about anti-lockdown politics. Some of it was non-far right. It was certainly drawn from across the political spectrum, from different ethnic backgrounds, genders. However, there was obviously a large crossover with the far right. Uh, and one of the major things we're really concerned about in the report is how the conspiracy theory movement and the engagement with conspiracy theories in the last year is creating new pathways towards anti-Semitism and far right politics. Um, traditionally, if we looked at, say, Holocaust denial and anti-Semitism, we would find people be radicalized towards Holocaust denial through the far right, for example, or, you know, there's, there's other routes to it. But the way we would look at it, I hope not hate, would primarily focus on individuals being radicalized through the far right. But now what we've seen really worrying is COVID-19 related conspiracy theories providing a new route towards anti-Semitic politics, or certainly an enhanced route. Online spaces that have been used to push anti-lockdown and conspiratorial explanations for the pandemic are providing new pathways, one by which the incremental steps that build towards anti-Semitism and Holocaust denial and even admiration of Hitler are in fact a progression through different conspiracy theories. Conceptualizing the conspiracy scene as essentially a bookcase, if you will, with, you know, at one end you might have, you know, 9-11 conspiracies or moon landing conspiracies and then you they work their way through these books uh, until they reach holocaust denial so we talk about this at length about the the worrying is when you talk about there being a grand conspiracy behind uh, covid19 it demands a conspirator uh, and all too often as we know through history when they're looking for a conspirator it's the jewish people uh, that are blamed and we're seeing that once again and that's something we, we need to be really really aware of going forward Another one, again, that has also been mapped, we talk at length about the reaction to Black Lives Matter. And of course, there was an, a really positive and exciting set series of demonstrations across the continent where people came together uh, to raise their voice against systemic racism, colonial histories. But of course, unsurprisingly, the far right had backlashed against this, um, which won't come as a great surprise. We saw this in a couple of ways. We saw existing what you might call racial nationalist organizations, explicitly anti-black groups with long histories, uh, attempting to exploit this moment. And we do some data work in the report where we talk about how the far right talking in terms of race and whiteness uh, went up quite dramatically last year. Another thing we saw is groups and individuals, essentially their masks slipped. And by that, I mean, people on the far right who had spent many years saying, we do not care about race, we're not interested in race and racism. We just care about culture and our identity. We saw that mask slip when they reacted to Black Lives Matter as they talked once again in more openly and explicitly anti-black and overtly racist terms. So that's one to watch as well about whether or not we're seeing the re-radicalization or the more explicitly re-racialization of the European far right. That's, that's one we need to be careful of. Um, and then of course, I just wanted to touch on terrorism. Um, uh, that's been mentioned a few times. We've seen really, really worrying levels of terrorism activity across the continent. In the United Kingdom, we've seen record levels of terrorist arrests from the far right in the last few years. What we're actually, when we think about how the modern terrorist network, yes, there are, of course, as I'm sure we're all aware, those kind of traditional neo-Nazi terror networks, Combat 18, Blood and Honor. We saw the National Socialist Underground with its reign of terror over many years in Germany. Uh, so there is that sort of thing there where individuals are engaging in explicit attacks. We saw Halla, we've, we've seen uh, El Paso in America, we've seen this, this wave of terror attacks, Germany being especially affected by these. But we're also seeing the current far-right terror threat constituting a network of loose organizations often acting online. Uh, these are kind of modeled after one group and then are shut down and then move on. Activists often engage in multiple groups simultaneously and are often finding networks to engage with each other uh, on, in the corners of the internet. 
Now, when it comes to this sort of politics, it's less about Facebook and Twitter and YouTube, and it's more about Telegram. It's more about Gab. And here we, we need to kind of, we talk about this in the report, but understand the role that social media ecosystem is playing in far-right activism. It's not just that we see, of course, damaging racism, xenophobia, misogyny, homophobia on mainstream social media platforms, but in other alternative social media spaces like Telegram, we are seeing networks of terrorism develop and foster, and we're still yet to see enough action taken against that. In the UK, we will hopefully have the online harms bill coming forward by the end of the year, and I know there's NetDG in Germany and there's talk about more European-wide legislation but the role that social media companies are playing in the spreading of far-right propaganda and pr producing the networking capability for the international far-right is really, really important and worrying. So terrorism, uh, partly motivated by conspiracy beliefs, but also by environmentalism uh, with eco-fascism and the like, is something we really need to keep an eye on. Uh, we've seen it once and we will see it again. And then just to finish... We did polling, and this was a very large poll that we talk about in the report. We polled 12,000 people across eight major European countries. It was did Sweden, France, Germany, the UK, uh, Hungary, Poland, and Italy. And unsurprisingly, perhaps, but rather sadly, it revealed a very worryingly large number of people holding hostile views towards minority groups. Um, just a few of the top lines. When we polled around anti-immigrant sentiment, the country with the lowest negative feelings towards immigrants and Muslims was the UK, and that was 30% and 26% respectively. The best numbers was even as bad as 30% of the population holding anti-immigrant sentiments. Uh, if you look across to say Hungary though, negative feelings extended to a majority of the population. 60% had a very or quite negative view of immigrants, and 54% had a very or quite negative view of Muslims. Um, immigration was one of the top four concerns for people in France, Germany, Italy, the Netherlands, and Sweden. Um, there is, the numbers are really worrying in terms of widespread uh, anti-immigrant and especially anti-Muslim sentiments. Uh, another thing we polled around was political disaffection. Uh, and we polled on this because people look to the far right when they feel that the systems in which they are living are not uh, de dealing with the problems that they face in their daily life. Uh, and so political disaffection is an interesting and useful marker to say where we might see spaces for far-right growth. Um, broadly speaking, there is a deep well of mistrust in authorities that could prov uh, prove uh, really exploitable by the far-right. Uh, in political disenfranchisement, it was particularly pronounced in Italy and France, with 79% and 67% respectively feeling that the system is broken wholly or in part. That was 63% in Poland, 58% in the UK, and 55% in Hungary. The number of people that believe the political systems in which they live, essentially liberal democracies in terms of Western Europe, are not dealing uh, with their problems is really worryingly high. 74% um, of Italians, 63% of Poles, 59% of French people, 52% of British people, and 50% of Swedes felt that their country is going in the wrong direction in some way. Again, really worrying numbers. There is a worrying minority who believe in a form of uh, far-right ideology as well, called the Great Replacement, which many of you may have heard of, the identitarian movement in, in Europe. Essentially, the idea that there is a plan, uh, a supposed genocide against the white populations of Europe. 16% in the United Kingdom believe that to be true, all the way up to 45% believed it to be true in Hungary, which is perhaps no surprise when Viktor Orban has been saying the same himself. Um, this is really important. You know, in some ways, what we're talking about here is the institutions and pillars of liberal democracy being undermined uh, and people not believing that they will deal with the problems in their lives. And when we see these levels of disenfranchisement, uh, we often open a door to far right extremism. And in some cases, of course, these people are not wrong to be angry or upset. Um, it's, I'm not here saying that the people in France that believe the system is not working for them are wrong. Uh, there's many problems in numerous European countries. What I'm saying is that it gives us an understanding that the far right could exploit this. Another thing we talk about at length, which is especially pertinent at the moment in the United Kingdom with some of the events of the last few weeks, is the role that anti-feminism and, and misogyny is playing in the contemporary scene. When it comes to far right politics in Europe, while of course race and racism is, is the traditional route into far right politics, 
misogyny and anti-women and anti-feminist politics is increasingly important as a route into far-right extremism. Uh, and also there is really high levels of societal misogyny. The poll also uh, found some interesting patterns here. Significantly, 41% of Swedes think that feminism is definitely or somewhat responsible for the feeling of marginalization and demonization experienced by some men in society. This was Poland, 30%, the UK, 28%, France, 25%, uh, and the lowest agreement of the sentiment was Italy, 15%. Now, the only caveat I want to just quickly add there is this might be because, for example, the feminist movement in Sweden is, is strong and has had numerous victories in recent decades, and so it's more known about and more so the, the backlash has been stronger. So I'm not saying necessarily that we have higher levels of misogyny in Sweden than Italy, but generally speaking across the board, the polling indicates that lots of people are blaming feminism uh, as, a, uh, as a, an explanation for their personal perspectives or problems. And then finally, we of course polled around Black Lives Matter. Um, when asked if they people had sympathy with the Black Lives Matter protests, uh, it highlighted races uh, in terms of how they highlighted racism and discrimination. Uh, a majority in Germany, 52%, Sweden, 51%, and the UK, 51%, said they did have some level of sympathy for the messages behind Black Lives Matter. This is something we can build on that majority do. Though I would say, of course, um, for those of us on this call, I'm sure that the, the demands of the Black Lives Matter movement to, to, to tackle systemic and structural inequality and racism, we would all hope perhaps that more than 50% of our populations agreed with those sentiments. So there's clearly, again, lots of work to do. Um, in France, the Netherlands, Poland and Italy, fewer people sympathised with them than they uh, supported them. So there's a brief overview of the polling. Uh, there's some very worrying numbers in there. There's also some uh, pos more positive numbers, which I would encourage you to do read the report and, and have a look. We talk about these at length. But broadly speaking, the report essentially shows uh, the key takeaways are the far right is an international threat. They collaborate across borders. They might be primarily concerned about their own country or their own community, but they think internationally. And if we're going to engage in real anti-racism, we need to engage in anti-racism across borders. We need to collaborate. Um, there is a backlash against the calls for racial equality in the form of Black Lives Matter. There is um, a really worrying explosion of engagement with conspiracy theory content. And in the long run, we might see an uptick uh, through that in terms of engagement with anti-Semitic conspiracy theories. And as a movement, as well as being a problem in our parliamentary chambers across the continent, they pose a danger on our uh, streets, in our communities, in our mosques, in our synagogues and as a terrorist threat. Um, the good news is, to finish, in all cases, they remain a minority. Um, a majority of people do not vote for far-right parties in Europe. A majority of people uh, still class themselves as anti-fascist in some form. And so if we work together and we build these networks, have meetings like this, collaborate across borders, um, I'm extremely confident. Um, that the rising tide of prejudice that I'm talking about in this report can be pushed back. Uh, I think we can fight back, but it will demand collectively coming together and working together across borders um, and across Europe. So yeah, thanks very much for having us and, and um, please do have a look at the report. There's loads of good stuff in there. Thanks. Thank you so much, Joe, for that really insightful overview. I appreciate you trying to kind of shape the ending as a positive note, but certainly, yeah, we've seen that even though these parties don't hold majorities, their numbers have certainly increased in many, in many countries, which is certainly worrying rather than um, uh, a positive note. Um, thank you for all these really kind of important to take away headlines, the role of conspiracy theories, the internationalization, as you stressed, um, the explanation around the great replacement theory and the very interesting anti-feminism caveat, which I think um, is very well integrated within the, the great replacement theory. And as well, your point about this being an expression of the fact that the pillars of liberal democracy itself are, are being shaken. Um, so I would perhaps turn to Gemma now. And when, when, we, when Joe spoke, his focus has been on what the far right is doing, how the far right is organizing, and what are the 
um, views of society as a whole towards different minority groups. Um, but the other side of the story is, of course, the impact on those targeted communities, on minorities, racialized groups, Jews, Muslims, Roma, people of color, LGBTQI folks, and so on. Um, so I wonder how you at Hope Not Hate are thinking through that part of the story, which is sort of ultimately the part that is our main concern, the protection and the well-being and the ability to thrive of the targeted communities. So perhaps you could speak to this angle of the story. Sure, thank you so much um, for having us. Um, thank you, Alina. Um, I just wanted to also, um, as well as saying thank you to everybody for being here, I wanted to acknowledge somebody who isn't here today because she's on maternity leave, um, which is the co-editor of the report with Joe, Sophia Khan Ruth, um, who, who um, is another uh, home hate researcher and, um, she would have been here, I, I'm sure, if, if she were not on maternity leave, she's just a, a beautiful baby boy. Um, so um, the reason that Hope Not Hate is called Hope Not Hate is because it was originally a campaign. And the campaign um, was uh, based on some research that we did when we were flying to the BMP. Um, and what we found was that people didn't just uh, dislike the far right and dislike their messages, they wanted a positive alternative. Um, and that's where the name Hope Not Hate came from. Um, and from that campaign against far-right political parties has, has, has come a whole organization. Um, and what's really important about what we do at Hope Not Hate is the way um, the different elements of our work interact. So I wanted to spend a couple of minutes talking about that because I think that that's a model which anyone working against any kind of inequity can, can really take forward. Um, so as we've seen, we do in-depth research. Um, and um, that can be everything from really academic level in research through to sort of infiltration of far right groups, whether that's online or offline. So we can get a really good picture of where the far right are, where the trends are. Um, this is our first European state of hate report, but actually in the UK, we've been producing a British state of hate report every year. Um, and and the, the, the benefit of doing it annually is that we can see where trends are going, which things are bubbling up, we can try and spot and, and, and start thinking structurally about what to do about that. So that's our research. As well as the research, obviously we do a lot of data, a lot of polling, um, and we use that to uh, inform our policy work. Um, and we engage on a campaign level with government, um, but we also work with local, local um, authorities. Um, and we try and get information where it's needed to people who can really make change. A good example of that is the work we're doing in towns at the moment. Towns often being a place where people are vulnerable to those narratives of the far right that um, you know to use a sense of left behind but that sense of disenfranchisement that people have um, is it, it, going to be in those places where you know there are limited opportunities there are limited economic opportunities and job opportunities so um, we do a lot of work to engage with the communities that are vulnerable to the politics come and, and the ideologies of the far right um, as well as that, we have an education unit. And again, we try to go into schools in these areas where students are much more likely to be exposed to far right ideas. We go to schools where they are prim primarily monocultural, um, where they have limited uh, engagement with people who are different from them. Um, and um, we, we do a lot of interactive work with students, but we also work with um, teachers and do a lot of teacher training because often the teachers themselves have limited uh, cultural uh, capacity to, uh, to, to respond to things which are happening in classrooms. And just touching on, on the issue of misogyny again, what we find with young people in particular is a kind of self-editing um, um, when it comes to racism, which we don't find with misogyny. So that often a good way in to get children thinking about how they relate to other people is to start by looking at misogyny because they will they will edit their responses if we if we do an interactive workshop they will know the right answers to give when it comes to racism but often um, sadly we're going backwards with with quite a lot of young people about how they think about feminism how they think about about the roles of men and women for example so that can be a really good way of, of getting children to self-reflect and a lot of our work is not about what we think it's about speaking to people about what they think. So um, that applies to children, but that also applies to the, all of the vulnerable communities that we go to. It's really important that we go to where people are at. 
And of course, that that is going to have the most, the biggest Im impact on whether people are prepared to engage with people who are different to them or who they perceive as different to them. If they feel listened to, if they feel that their perspective has been acknowledged and understood, they're much more likely to be able to get some movement. Um, in terms of uh, what we can do, um, we also do a lot of community work where we're bringing different communities together um, and finding ways to celebrate our, our similarities, but also finding ways to celebrate our differences. You know, integration is a word which um, I think certainly in Britain is considered almost like a one-way street. I, I would say this is true across a lot of Europe as well. This idea that you have to be more French, more British, more German. And actually we don't see integration like that. We see integration as the ability to celebrate all our differences within a national identity. And that there's nothing wrong with being proud of your national identity, but understand the diversity that that is, that is part of a national identity in, in 21st century Europe. So all of those things work off each other symbiotically, and that's the model that we that we use. Um, you know, our research can can inform our education. What we're seeing in a classroom, we can ask our, our research team to go back and look more into. So everything everything works together in a system that helps us have more impact. Um, and then obviously we do a lot of work with the Home Office, uh, with police and probation letting getting our research out to where it's most needed whether that's to impact policy or whether that's to impact um, what's happening on the ground in communities um i wanted to also just talk about um covid in particular and and some of the work that we've been doing particularly with the government's independent anti-muslim hatred working group where um, we've been distinguishing we've been doing a lot of work on covid conspiracy theories but we've also when it comes to the vaccination take-up we've been doing a lot of work behind the scenes and uh, to get messages out to communities which are vaccine hesitant and again it's about understanding where those hesitancies hesitancy come from if your community has experienced structural racism within a health service then of course you're going to be more wary when it comes to engaging with what that health service has to offer you so um, it's about getting a message from a trusted messenger from within those communities, um, not, not a, a politician, you know, whether that's an imam or whether that's a local GP, somebody who people really relate to, to actually address some of the structural inequalities that COVID has brought so much to the front, in, both in terms of, of um, how it's impacted uh, on, on a health perspective, but also in terms of how we've seen the, the, the inequalities in who is exposed, you know, through through their uh, daily lives, whether that's because they work as care assistants, whether they work in the NHS, and and, and how much more vulnerable um, minority communities have been um, in in the pandemic. So again, that kind of like looking at what we know and getting out to where it can be useful. We do lots and lots of collaborative work. Um, we're working now with the um, uh, uh, migrant rights and and uh, um, refugee sector giving them useful information about how the far right is weaponizing some of the trends in migration um, into Britain and allowing them to contextualize what's happening from the far right perspective. Um, obviously they're there supporting uh, migrants and asylum seekers, but it's really important that they know what else is being pushed back against them within the wider context and, and where the far right is shifting the national narrative and how they can, how they can best push back against that. So that's a really good example of where you know there's a there's a specific uh, group who are vulnerable. Um, they're rightly focused on supporting those people who are vulnerable, but actually we have an added layer of expertise which can help them maintain the space they need to do the job they need to do. Um, so I think that's that's a probably a, a quite a quick roundup of the kind of approach that we take. Um, and obviously, we're always keen to find people to work with, both in the UK and across Europe, um, and to sort of like use both our expertise, but also um, the way we structure what we know um, and share that with people so that other people can take that up too. Thanks so much, Gemma. And I think it's so important to kind of also hear this more uplifting side of the story of all the work that you are doing to respond to the trends that we've heard sort of outlined um, outlined by Joe, and I particularly took note of this um, um, point about integration being a one-way street generally. I think you, you put it really well, and it's perhaps something that you don't usually think about, but once you, you put it in this shape, I think it becomes really clear 
um, what the issue is there. Um, I also noted this point about kind of meeting people where they are, um, speaking to folks in good faith, trying to understand where they're coming from, um, and having this listening um, mode. And also, I appreciate the anecdote about uh, where your name is coming from and this idea that people need a positive response and not just uh, to, to be disappointed or angry about um, about something. I think that's really important. So thank you so much for that. Um, and perhaps this sort of um, community-centric approach is a, a good segue to hearing from Tamash um, and getting a little bit of insight into the work that equality bodies are doing on this front. Um, I do want to get you to reflect on both Joe and Gemma's interventions, but I think before that it would just be useful for our audience to um, understand a little bit better what Equinet does and what the role of equality bodies more generally is. What are their prerogatives? What's the limits of their work um, as well? And that will help us understand better um, where you are coming from. Sure, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Alina. And thank you for the invitation to Nidrith, uh, RD, and Hope Not Hate uh, to reflect on this important report. Uh, indeed, I work for Equinet, uh, which brings together 47 national equality bodies from across Europe. They are public institutions. They work to promote equality and tackle discrimination across a range of grounds, which includes age, gender, racial or ethnic origin, disability, religion or belief, sexual orientation. So they are public institutions that's important to remember. And in accordance with the Racial Equality Day Directive from 2000, all EU member states and uh, also the candidate countries, by the way, are required to set up an equality body, so across Europe. Um, what they do is uh, they assist uh, victims of discrimination with uh, legal advice, uh, litigation or deciding on their complaints that depends on, on how the country is organizing their own uh, systems and their own equality body. They also monitor and report on uh, discrimination issues uh, and they also contribute to an awareness of rights, a realization of these rights uh, and uh, the societies that, uh, that value uh, equality. Um, the role of equality bodies is really to promote equality and to fight uh, discrimination regardless of the source. So Equinet hasn't really conducted dedicated work on far-right extremism like uh, Hope Not Hate did, uh, but rather we concentrate uh, on issues of discrimination and hate in society in general, uh, which is also in line with the need for our members as public authorities to remain neutral and independent uh, from politics. And then there are other issues that limit how equality bodies can engage uh, against hate, because many of them uh, currently lack a mandate uh, on uh, hate crimes and on hate speech, which means that they cannot deal with that. The Council of Europe and the European Commission, they both recommended that hate speech uh, should be within the mandate of all equality bodies. Um, hate crime is a little bit more complicated as it's a criminal matter and that is usually reserved uh, for the courts, for the, for the judiciary. Um, another issue is the, the powers that equality bodies have because many equality bodies uh, at the moment lack the power to, to litigate, to take cases to the courts or alternatively to, uh, to take legally binding decisions. Uh, again, here, European standards, both at the Council of Europe level and at the EU level, suggest that this should be remedied, and we hope to hear a commitment uh, tomorrow at the Anti-Racism Summit by uh, the European Commission to propose a legislative initiative uh, setting legally binding standards uh, for equality bodies. But with all this in mind, uh, even equality bodies that lack currently a mandate to litigate or to take legal action, they can use their powers uh, to research hate, to raise awareness about it, to give advice to policymakers, and to communicate with value-based uh, messages, uh, counter-narratives and positive alternative narratives. Because I think 
uh, working with people, including those that are exposed to far right ideology. And I'm picking up here what Gemma mentioned. Uh, this is very important. I think we need to show them that uh, hope and love are the right thing to do, and they are stronger and better than hate. So this is, uh, in a nutshell, uh, on, on equality bodies and their powers uh, in, in general. Thank you, Tomasz. And I think it's actually very useful for you to speak as well of the limitations, because I suspect it provides civil society with sort of additional um, action points, things to bring into discussions with policymakers and to further further call for. And I, I um, took note of you mentioning the racial equality directive in the beginning, because I was actually hoping to touch on as well the framework uh, decision on xenophobia uh, from 2008, which I think touches on a lot of the issues we're discussing here today regarding Nazi um, glorification, symbolism, Holocaust denial, among other issues. And I was just um, wondering your take to what I perceive as really a gap between the existing legislative framework and in practice, the rather limited extent to which this is actually being brought to trial. Yes, I know. I think that uh, implementation of, uh, of EU legislation, I mean, we have good pieces of EU legislation uh, on, on the race uh, front. Uh, the Racial Equality Directive, for example, is the strongest when it comes to the uh, anti-discrimination or equal treatment directives. Um, Arguably, it still needs to be further developed because, for example, um, it doesn't provide any guarantees from the European level against uh, racism and, and racial discrimination in, uh, in police actions, for example, or, or actions by the state uh, in general. So I think that um, there is uh, that there are some gaps, but still it's a it's a relatively strong piece of legislation, much stronger, for example, than what exists at the EU level um, against discrimination on the basis of age or disability. Um, and yet, the real problem is, uh, as as is often the case with legislation, is that it's not properly implemented. Um, I think that there is a that, there is a political will that is missing, for sure. Uh, that's an issue. Um, and uh, actually politicians, I think, uh, and I propose have a special responsibility, yet they often contribute to the problem instead of helping to find a solution. Uh, and we have seen some examples of that uh, in the report as well. We can see some examples of that in the report as well uh, that, uh, that, that Joe uh, presented. Uh, this is, for example, why Equinet, uh, as the, the network of equality bodies, published a recommendation two years ago um, on combating discrimination and hate speech uh, in election campaigns. Um, I think that's, uh, that's really interesting. And uh, also the importance of the political will I think some of the data in the report, uh, for instance, showing attitudes towards immigrants or Muslims in certain countries that were polled um, in the preparation of the report, clearly demonstrates uh, the impact that the constant fear mongering and campaigning against uh, certain groups, um, even in the absence of such groups in society, as is the case in, 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 in some of the countries. Uh, so what this fearmongering and campaigning by the politicians uh, and by the government, uh, these terrible effects that can have on, on the collective uh, mindset uh, and, and, and attitudes uh, of, of citizens. And then there are some, some massive issues also around the understanding among the legal professionals uh, of what is exactly that um, is needed. Um, and not just the legal professionals, but also law enforcement when it comes to hate crimes, for example. Um, and then there is also the added issue of uh, enforcement and the lack of proper enforcement. For example, in the, in the Racial Equality Directive, uh, it requires that sanctions against discrimination uh, have to be effective, proportionate and dissuasive, and they are anything but dissuasive in most of the cases. Uh, and this, of course, again, is uh, just uh, an even bigger problem 
uh, when it comes to hate speech and hate crimes, which I think we can see from the point of view of equality bodies who are trying to find an angle to, to deal with hate speech and hate crimes, even in the absence of a legal uh, mandate, uh, they look at it as the most extreme manifestations of discrimination. Uh, and, and it is something that is uh, undoubtedly influenced and increased by the deteriorating uh, social and political environment uh, where more and more forces are, are seeking to divide the society and uh, they are increasingly searching for easy answers to very complex uh, societal questions. They are increasingly looking for simple messages. And most importantly, they are looking for enemies and scapegoats, and they, found, they find them in, in, in racialized communities. And I think that this is, uh, this is definitely a concern and, uh, and this deteriorating um, uh, political, social environment is, uh, is definitely something that we can see um, by, by, by equality bodies. Um, I also wanted to mention that uh, to me, a major issue when I, when I read the report, uh, to me, a major issue was that uh, was evident from the report. And it's, it's kind of a little bit also the elephant in the room is that uh, far right extremism is one thing. But to me, one of the most important problems is how far right is influencing mainstream parties. I mean, a few years ago, for example, Fidesz uh, in, in Hungary, wouldn't have been called a far right party, and now the report doesn't have any any uh, problems calling uh, Fidesz a far right party, um, and I think that this shows how the far right is actually influencing mainstream parties and pushing them uh, towards uh, towards the extreme and um, making it more difficult to distinguish uh, what's far right and and what's uh, some mainstream parties. Um, which leads to far-right parties and movements uh, perhaps losing the battle, the political battle on the face of it in certain countries. But in reality, that might be because uh, the mainstream parties are picking up and taking their views and ideas, which uh, is, of course, uh, infinitely more, uh, more, more risky and, and problematic. So that, that I think, is, 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 is a very important point to me. Um, and another issue, uh, it, it's very good that uh, um, uh, gender equality and, and misogynism uh, also came up because I think another issue which, uh, which we see and which I think is important to mention is how many racists uh, increasingly start to pose as uh, protectors of, uh, for, ex for instance, women's rights or Jewish communities against uh, threats by immigrants or religious groups. Uh, so I think that's, that's also very interesting uh, and, 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 and very uh, powerful and, and, and problematic uh, dynamic. Um, COVID-19 was mentioned a lot. Uh, we also saw that from the, from the side of equality bodies that uh, um, hate speech against certain racial communities really increased um, the, the number of um, a uh, number of uh, um, theories about uh, who is behind the, uh, the, the, the whole pandemic, uh, that also increased. And uh, kind of the lockdowns, I think, also helped to move this to, to more to the online sphere, uh, which made it uh, obviously less dependent on, on traditional institutional mechanisms and frameworks uh, such as political parties. So it was self-propelled by, uh, by uh, uh, really um, problematic uh, um, theories and, and dynamics uh, online. But also for me to, to, to kind of uh, finish my, my, my this round of reflections on a more positive note is, uh, is an interesting example from Finland, which is linked to the equality body there, the non-discrimination ombudsman. And it's, it's also mentioned in the report how the Supreme Court last year decided to ban the neo-Nazi Nordic resistance movement in September 2020. Um, and that debate, which led 
uh, ultimately to the to the banning of the Nordic resistance movement was initiated back in 2016 by the Finnish non-discrimination ombudsman, uh, who decided to address the issue following concerns uh, raised by representatives of the Jewish community in Finland. Um, and the good the good lesson, because I think some people are saying that. Uh, uh, you know, there is no point in banning far right uh, extreme groups and parties because they will just, you know, come up as mushrooms in, in other parts and, uh, and this will just, uh, you know, perhaps even increase their reach. But apparently the Finnish police board has reported that banning the, the Nordic resistance movement has resulted in that its activities, at least in Finland, have significantly diminished and that the organization is losing members and that its fundraising uh, has also dried up. Um, and the conclusions drawn by the Finnish police have also been echoed by scholars, adding, adding that the cooperation with neo-Nazis in other countries also seems to have decreased. So that, I think, is, uh, is the moral of this, is that, you know, we, we shouldn't shy away from uh, banning organizations and, and stepping up at certain points when it really reaches the, the criminal threshold and the threshold of... Uh, of um, uh, posing a risk to, to our whole society. And it's very interesting to see how uh, this is also an illustration of the international element of far right uh, and the different approaches. Uh, because for, for instance, in Sweden, the very same organization is uh, still allowed to operate. So that I think is, is also food for thought. I'll stop here, sorry. No, thank you so much, Tamash. I, I was going to say, I, I'm hoping to see that the other Scandinavian countries take the lead of Finland and, and also ban the Nordic resistance movement. And I think what you said about their activity and membership reducing is, is really, really important. Uh, perhaps just to pick up on a few of the, the points that you made, well taken point about the fact that far right extremist discourse tends to um, move along the mainstream um, as well. Um, I take the point about uh, sort of the instrumentalization um, of various minorities against each other. And this is something we see both on the far left and the far right. Um, and as well, um, I think it was just important to see the many, many different layers of bureaucracy and of actors that are involved from politicians, lawmakers, to law enforcement, shifting between the EU level and the national level. Um, I think it's just uh, important to be aware of the very complex, uh, complex system that you need to navigate um, in your work. Before coming to MEP Gonzalez and MEP Fofana for their reflections, perhaps I can just invite all our three speakers to give us sort of their top line, um, looking forward, what is the main avenue that you think is important to tackle? And perhaps you can each speak to your area of expertise. So on the research front, sort of on the community building and educational front, and then um, in your area of interacting with government and so on. So Joe, let me go to you first. Yeah, sure. Um, just very briefly on, on what Thomas said, really, really, really interesting comments there and really completely agree about the mainstreaming element of it. And I think if you look at the United Kingdom as a case study, um, we have an almost no electoral far right party in terms of the our upcoming elections in April. The British National Party, the National Front are shadows of their former selves. And yet we hear rhetoric that will traditionally be confined to the extremes or to the far right coming from much more mainstream political actors, much more mainstream media. Um, you know, we have our Home Secretary, Priti Patel, talking about migrants uh, and asylum seekers in a way that is indistinguishable at times from the far right. So I think that is a really, really important point. In some ways, the cordon sanitaire has burst uh, and uh, the far right is being allowed back out from beyond the pale. So I think that's really important. Um, I guess the big takeaway from all of this is about internationalization and international collaboration. Um, this will only continue. Uh, we see, uh, at Hope Not Hate, we spend our days monitoring the far right around the world. And while though we, of course, look at the traditional groups and the traditional political parties, every day we look at uh, groups on social media or Telegram channels, etc., 
which have people from 10 to 20 countries involved in them. Uh, and the only way we're going to be able to combat these networks is by collaborating across borders, sharing information across borders, legislating across borders. I know that's ironic coming from someone sat in London, um, but legislating across borders. And this is not just in terms of how we deal with things like hate crime, etc., but also how we deal with the challenges posed by social media and tech platforms. Um, all of these issues demand research happening around the world and collaboratively and they involve legislation and cooperation across borders. So um, despite the fact, rather embarrassingly, the British, uh, we've left the European Union, um, it doesn't mean that we uh, have, have left Europe. Uh, and it's gonna be fundamentally important that we continue to collaborate uh, in any ways we can, even outside of the European uh, parliamentary chambers. So yeah, they are international, the people we face are international, and so must we be if we're gonna push back uh, positively. Thanks for having us. Um, so I think uh, for me, uh, I mean, my initial thought was education, but actually it's a big, it's a bigger one than that, really. Um, I think it's about allyship um, and encouraging contact, because um, what the overarching thing we need to do is leave the far right out in the cold. And the only way we can do that is, you know, how do we get the mainstream to step back from these kind of the mainstreaming of far right narratives? is for people's lived experience to completely undermine what the far right are pushing. And how do we do that? The best way we can do that is for people to have contact with people who they think of dif uh, as different to themselves, um, for them to discover that actually they are invested in the same things. They want the same things for their children. They want the same things for the communities that they live in. Um, and that actually, if they work together, that is, is, is actually going to be more effective for what they um, you know, as, as individual groups or individual people might want. Um, and uh, I think the other thing to say on that is that um, it's, it's so powerful when a surprising ally steps up and speaks for a group that they're not part of. And I think the more we can all be active allies and speak out for each other, um, the more that we can shift the narrative. And as I say, my big thing is just let's push the far right right out into the cold where they are irrelevant. That's what we really want to get to. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I think that, um, well, if I want to focus on what, uh, you know, is, 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 is my field of expertise, then of course we need very strong legislation. We need very strong legislation from the European level. Um, like I said, we already have very good basics but we need to develop them further and we need to work on how it is enforced um, we also need to um, and of course then here i'm i'm, I'm talking uh, i'm talking home uh, we need to strengthen equality bodies because they have a great potential uh, standing between as independent but public institutions standing between governments and civil society uh, and you know can act in in certain ways that neither the government nor CSOs can. So I think that uh, uh, strengthening them, giving them more powers and more resources, and ensuring their independence be very important. Um, and easy for me, but if I want to make it easy, uh, it's you have to have all. You have to have the political will and support. You have communication. Uh, you need research. You need education um you have to tackle the problem from from all the directions otherwise we will not uh, not reach uh, what we want to reach thank you very much thank you tamash so i take note of strong legislation eu wide and also on the national level the importance of an international response and as well importantly the point about allyship and the importance of a surprising ally um, let me now turn to our host MEPs and perhaps um, I can start with MEP Gonzalez um, to hear any reflections you might have on the discussion and then we give the last word to MEP Fofana. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Nina. Um, thank you so much for this great uh, intervention. Thank you for all the people connecting in, in, in this event and for all your contribution today. I would like to add uh, that uh, this year will be also important in terms uh, of anti-resistant events in the parliament 
a Parliament uh, Committee of uh, Civil Liberties uh, requests a study on the relevance of the new anti-racism action plan. Our Arduin Interru College um, in Libe Committee proposed to their uh, committee a hearing in the second part of, uh, of, this, of this year. Uh, we are also discussing a proposal for a new resolution in the second part of, of the, the, this year. That's a good health implementation of the EU anti-racism agenda. I think the result of this re, uh, research could fill into all this parliamentary process. I see a great use of the result of your study. So I am uh, looking forward to continue on a discussion uh, how exactly we can continue the, uh, this uh, cooperation. Uh, thank you all the team, uh, your organization and, and the, our coordinator in, in RD Intergroup, Jelena, and, 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 and thank you so, so much for, for all support. Thank you very much, um, MEP Gonzalez. MEP Fofana, the microphone is yours. Um. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So thank you for this event and for your constructive uh, contributions. Uh, I would like to assure you that we in Ardi, we commit to advancing the fight against all forms of racism. We reacted and addressed structural racism via a parliamentary resolution following the killing of George Floyd and the Black Lives Matter protest. We contributed to the adoption of the first EU anti-racism action plan adopted in September last year. Now we are continuing to give our best to keep the fight against racism and especially structural racism high on the EU agenda. There is still a lot of resistance and denial of our experiences, especially by people in decision-making position. For that, we are also thankful to have you, to help us with sharing your result. I wish you success and I look forward to continue our cooperation. I must thank you also our coordinator, uh, Yelena, for her work. It was a lot to do for her. And I thank also my assistant, Amina, who is here helping me with the technique. And thank you very much for all of you. Thank you. Thank you so much, MEP um, Fofana. And with that, um, let me just close um, by encouraging you all to check out the European State of Hate report. You can find it on the Hope Not Hate website. And as well to tune in tomorrow for the EU's Anti-Racism Summit. Um, MEP Gonzalez, MEP Herzberger Fofana, thank you so much for co-hosting today's event. Um, and to Joe, Gemma, and Tamash, thank you for sharing all your insights. Um, let me also give a big shout out to Yelena as well. And on behalf of the European Parliament Anti-Racism and Diversity Intergroup, the Hope Not Hate Charitable Trust and the Neighbors International, thank you all who've uh, tuned in and we look forward to seeing you on future programs. Thank you and take care.